Hello. We even got a new message this time. Hello, hello, everybody. Good to see everyone today. I'll give you just a second to get connected. Very happy to see everyone for our third program in our four part series. So while you guys are getting connected, I'll go over just a bit of housekeeping information. So first of all, my name is Anissa Mitchell and I'm with PMD Alliance and I'm happy to see everyone's face with us today and glad you're joining us. If this is your first time um, in this series, I'll just do a short recap. So we are in the midst of a four part series in partnership with Kiowa Karen on the art and practice of planning. So far, we have covered planning for the future, asking for help, and today we're going to be tackling keeping up with treatments. Um, so before we get started, I want to um, let you know that we are going to be taking questions throughout the conversation today. There's not going to be any slides um, that I'm aware of, and we're going to be talking about different things where we will invite you to either chat a question if you have one, or you can ask directly a question by unmuting. Um, the only thing that we ask since we do have quite a few people planning to join us today is if you would raise your hand by using the reaction button. There's a raise your hand option. Um, that way it'll flag it so we can see it because otherwise we may miss it. Um, otherwise you can write in the chat box that you want to ask a question directly. Also, um, I want to uh, let you know there won't be a breakout today. Today, we're going to just have a conversation and we're going to be uh, going over some of the handouts. So I'll get to those in a minute, but we're going to be covering keeping up with treatments. So we know that there's a lot of medications available for treatments for lots of different symptom issues. It can be very challenging, we know, to keep up with them, to know what all the newer medications are, what they do. Um, it's also hard even managing all of your medications for yourself or your loved ones. So the problem often is understanding when are the medications no longer working? When do we need to adjust those medications or add to those? So that's some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Our speaker today is Dr. Ramon Rodriguez. He is um, a movement disorder specialist in Orlando. He's medical director of Neurology One. Um, and he's re recently, over the last year or so, written a book called Troubleshooting Parkinson's, a guide for caregivers, which has helped caregivers navigate some of these issues. The book actually looks like this. Have it close by. Um, and you've probably seen him on before. He's been on several shows um, that we've had. So we're excited to have him back. Um, but before we, we launch into that, you know that uh, some of this information has been framed around a survey that Kiowa Kieran did of care partners. Actually, they surveyed 695 care partners. They've had some really interesting findings, which is why we felt like it was important to share some of those through this program series. In this particular um, section, they found that nine out of 10 or 91% of care partners felt that their treatment options were improving the quality of life for their loved one, but they were very challenged in managing the medications and knowing when those medications actually stop working. Um, so we're gonna be tackling that today with Dr. Rodriguez. I'm so happy that he's joining us. Hi, Dr. Rodriguez. Before we get started though, um, we're gonna ask you a couple of poll questions. So we've done this before, um, but if this is your first time in this series, we're actually gonna pop up a question that we would love to get your feedback on. So if Kelly would uh, post the first question, we wanna know if you can tell when your loved ones or your own medications stop working. And we'll give you a second to ask or answer that question. Okay. All right, I'll give it a couple more seconds because I'd love to get as many people to answer this as we can. This is actually really helpful for us to know where you are, what kind of information you need. All right, so it looks like 
We've got a lot of people who most of the time know when their medications are working. Uh, we got 15% that do believe they know when their medications are working. 39% are unsure, 8% they don't know. So we're going to tackle that today. Um, and now let's go ahead and start the next poll because that frames the rest of the conversation. So this one wants to know if you have a good system for tracking and managing your medications. Okay. We kept this one pretty simple, only two, two options to answer. Looks like most people do have a pretty good system for tracking, a few people that could use some help. All right. All right, well, thank you because I feel like it's good to kind of see where the people that we're, we're talking with today actually are. So Dr. Rodriguez, let's start with, with knowing when someone's medications aren't working anymore. Can you first start off by explaining motor fluctuations, the different types of off? Because I still think that even though we talk about off a lot, we don't necessarily still completely understand. There's still some confusion. Definitely. So uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, uh, Anissa and the PMD Alliance. And, and thank you for the uh, participants to be here today, because that tells me that there is a big interest in learning more about what is happening to my Parkinson's disease and what can I do to make things better. So, you know, I, I think that the first, uh, the first question is, you know, what, what is enough episode and then how, how we make, you know, how can we identify this easier? And let me go ahead and explain this to you because listen, for the past 15, 16 years, we have been trying to find better ways to help our patients identify the on and off episodes. And the reason for that is that that is the basis of clinical research this day. So people need to identify what an off and what an um, on um, state is. And let me tell you uh, something that I came across just recently. I have a very good friend who is a movement disorder specialist, uh, Dr. Gill. And uh, the other day uh, we were uh, trying to explain this to some patients and, uh, and he used this analogy, which I found it to be very useful, right? So let's pretend, and it is gonna take some time, so just pay attention, okay? So. You, you, you know that at home you have the switch to turn your light on and off, right? And you turn the switch on and or you turn it off and it's either bright or, or it is very dark, right? But in my house, I have a dimmer. So I actually can graduate how bright I want the light or, or how dark I want the room, right? So, so let's assume that the dimmer has, has the number zero to 10 and zero is when, when the light is totally off. And 10 is when the light is very bright, so bright that I cannot even look at it, okay? So when we talk about on and off in Parkinson's, a very common misconception from patients is that you are either on or you are off. So it's, it's, a, it's an all or none, it's a yes or a no, right? But, but it is not like that, there is a big gray zone, right? And this is very important because this information is critical for your doctor to make the adjustments to your medicines. So you know that when you have a dimmer, if I'm turning the light on, you know, I am at the zero, one, two, and three. And you know, zero, one, two, that light is getting a little bit brighter and I see that the light is on, but it might not be showing any, it might not be spreading any light. The, the room still looks dark. I don't feel comfortable walking in that room because even though I see that the light is on there, it's not that powerful. It's not that bright to illuminate the whole room, right? So that's what happens when somebody has not taken the medication for two or three days or somebody to, has well, not taken my um, hearing medicines, right? So that is a full, you know, that's what we call a full off state basically. Then when we go to the four, five, six, at that point, the patient is turning on, they're having some better benefit from the medicine. So if it is the dimmer, you know, 
Now the room is getting lighter and the, the light is helping us move around. And when we compare that to Parkinson's, now the patient is walking better, the tremors are getting better, the speech is getting better. However, when we get to the seven in that scale, seven is the best state. This is when people feel like they don't even have Parkinson's disease sometimes, you know, and people tell me, doctor, if I can stay at this level, I will be the happiest person because I, I, I can move, my tremors are improved, I can communicate and I'm feeling really good, right? So the seven, that's the lucky seven, the best number that you can be. If I go to the eight, now the light is getting a little bit brighter. So in Parkinson's, what that means is that you might be getting a little bit of dyskinesias. And the dyskinesias can be very mild that you might not even be aware of them. And you're feeling good and you can move around. So you feel in a really good state. And if we go to the nine or the 10, now the light is very bright, right? You have to cover your eyes. So those are the patients that are having now more dyskinesia. So now we went too far. So, so you can be off, you can be very off, you can be on, or you can be on plus have some dyskinesias, right? And the dyskinesias can be mild that you might not even be aware of them, or you are aware of them, but they don't bother you. Or you are aware of them and they bother you a lot, right? So that would be, you know, in, in the case of the light, that would be the light that is pretty light, like uh, too bright. I, I cannot see anymore here in this room. So somebody with Parkinson's is when they're having just a lot of these kinesias that sometimes, you know, they might fall out of a chair. So you see that the on and off is not an all or non phenomenon. You can be a little bit off. You can be very off. And this information is important because if my patient comes to me and tell me, you know what, doctor, I'm, I'm just a little bit off, you know, in that scale, I feel like I am in a five and I want to be at the seven. So what that tells me is that I just have to make a small adjustment to the medicine to take you to that level. But if the patient is coming and they're telling me, doctor, I'm, I'm off, like I'm taking my medicine and I feel like I am a one, I'm not getting anything from it. So then if I have to make the adjustment to the medicine, I have to increase the dosage even more in order to provide the benefit for my patient. So that's, those are the gradations of the on and off symptoms, right? And always the goal is to keep you in a state where you feel that you are very mobile, which in this case, we're gonna call it the, the, the seven, which is the best number, okay? So initially, when a person is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, you start taking your carbidopa, levodopa, one tablet three times a day. And because, you know, these are the early stages of Parkinson's, your, your uh, brain is making levodopa, I'm, so, I'm sorry, your brain is making dopamine, plus you are supplementing the dopamine, the brain, you tend to feel good. And when you don't take the medicine, your brain is making some and vice versa, and everything goes very well. People tend to respond very well, but as the Parkinson disease advances, those brain cells that make dopamine begin to wear off and, and they are degenerating. So that extra supply of dopamine that we were getting is slowly fading away. And this is when your doctor, you know, when the patient feels like the medication is not lasting enough, it's not lasting enough because we don't have that supplement from, from dopamine that the brain was still making helping you feel better. So your doctor will have to compensate by increasing the dose of the medication. And as time goes by, depending how your Parkinson is progressing. And the one thing that we have to understand is that Parkinson is a very individual condition, right? Not, no two patients are alike, everybody's different. So what happens is that as the condition continues progressing, your doctor needs to make adjustments that are going to be different from, from the other person. And I always tell the story that I have two patients. They were brothers. They had Parkinson's disease. And they were always telling me about how the other dog brother was doing. And, and I think my brother is doing better than I am. And then the other brother will come and tell me, my brother is doing better. Give me what he's taking. Right? And what happened is that they both had completely opposite types. One of them was a shaky type of Parkinson's. The others was not, right? So, so the brother that was shaking will see the brother not shaking, and, and he thinks that it's because of the medicine. It's not the medicine. It's just that his Parkinson's is like that. So the on and off 
basically what they're telling us is how you are responding to the medication in terms of your mobility in particular. And this information is critical because when you participate even in a clinical research study or when we do research these days, because we do not have a blood test for Parkinson's severity, we as doctors depend on the information that you as a patient or caregiver will tell us about how the patient is doing so we can actually make a decision whether the medication can be approved or not by the FDA and can be made available for everybody. So I hope that that helps to understand that the on and the off is not a, it's not black or white, right? There's a big gray zone and there are many shades in that gray zone where, where you know, you're having a little bit of improvement and more improvement and now you feel great and now you probably have too much, right? So, so that will happen when you have the, the dyskinesias, you are very on then. So, Dr. Rodriguez, it's, it is such a balancing act. And I know that we um, talked about some of the, the, the motor symptoms. Can you touch on, you know, a little bit about some of the non-motor symptoms that might arise during the wearing off? Um, Definitely. Definitely. I think so, that's something that's helpful for people to understand as well. It's not just motor symptoms. They can often feel it from a, from an internal perspective and other non-motor symptoms, if that's correct. Yes, yes, that is correct. So, so we always pay attention to the motor symptoms, which is the, the, the tremors, the stiffness, the slowness associated with Parkinson's. However, there are other symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease such as constipation. Uh, some people will have depression. Some people will have apathy. Some people will have anxiety. Some people will have panic attacks, right? And, uh, and when a person is experiencing the off time, not only is gonna be that the person having either more tremors or more trouble walking, but the way that it will present in some people is that they might be having some anxiety. They might have anxiety attacks. They might have panic attacks and they feel like this sensation of doom that they're going to die, you know, and, and they might call 911 and they want to be taken into the hospitals. And, uh, and it, can be, it can be just very challenging because most of the time it's very difficult to correlate those symptoms with the Parkinson. So people end up going to the hospital, they end up having large and, and extended cardiac workups. Uh, some people will be uh, depressed. And it is not until we sit down and talk about the correlation of the, of the medicine intake, you know, and, and probably the best question in this case is when you develop your anxiety or you develop those symptoms, do they improve after you take your carbidopa, levodopa? And if the answer is yes, most likely what you're experiencing is a non motor off. Just recently, I had a patient here, she was having a horrendous panic attack and it had been happening for two weeks and, and the husband, he just didn't know what else to do and he was very frustrated. He had taken her to the hospital multiple times. So I just told him like, just bring her here, have her spend the whole day here. So they spend like four to five hours here in the clinic, right? Until it happened. And then when it happened, I had the opportunity to take a look at it and it was more, you know, it didn't behave like an exacerbation of Parkinson's, it behaved more like an anxiety attack. And I, I was already expecting uh, what was going to happen. So I gave him a, a, a small pill of Xanax, you know, Alprazolam. The patient took it and within 20 minutes, we're done. You know, like she felt much better, symptoms were improved. Then we gave her the Parkinson's medicine and the symptoms resolved. And and, you know, the husband is telling me, yes, the, you know, I just need something that will be able to help me, right? Obviously, in her case, it's not to give her Xanax all the time, it's to adjust the medicine so she doesn't wear off from the beginning. So, so these off episodes come in many ways, including, including dizziness, including uh, anxiety, apathy, uh, depression. And sometimes I have patients that tell me, I know the medicine is wet enough because I start feeling anxious. I have another patient that she gets her rapid breathing and, and the husband ended up purchasing a pulse oximeter 
because after going to the hospital seven or eight times and everything was good, so now what he does is he puts the pulse oximeter and, and they can see, you, you can find this on Amazon for $20, right? And she, he, he, he shows her like, listen, you're 99%. So your lungs are working fine. You're oxygenating very well. So these things happen and they can be very bothersome. They actually can be even more bothersome than, uh, than the tremors and the stiffness associated with Parkinson's. And I always, you know, I always make this distinction that for most people, you can draw a line at six years after the diagnosis. And in the first six years, the wetting off is typically more, and what bothers people is more the tremors, the stiffness, the slowness. After the six years, it's more the, the anxiety that comes with this. I feel depressed. I have trouble swallowing. And, and those other non-motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease, and they can be uh, uh, seen fluctuating depending on the state of the medication that the patient is on. It's so complex. And of course, every person is so different. Um, so I'm glad that we're having this, this discussion because I don't think we could talk about it enough because it's just hard to sometimes know what's going on. Um, I had a person write in um, a question just about every afternoon. I have these terrible symptoms, including constricted throat, extreme exhaustion, where I feel as though my heart is skipping beats. Um, I went to the emergency room and was told that my heart is normal. This constricted throat goes hand in hand with rigidity across my chest, shoulder to shoulder. Is this off? So you know what? It, so it, it might be. Okay, and let me tell you what is the typical process that we follow in a person like this. So the first thing that we do is we have them see the heart doctor and do a heart workup to make sure that the heart is working well. We don't wanna mess with that, right? And then we have the doc, the patient see either uh, the gastroenterology just to make sure that there is not a stricture or any closing of the, of the esophagus and, and make sure that everything else is working fine, right? Once we make sure that the heart is working well, that the esophagus is open and everything is working well, and the doctors tell us, doctor, there's nothing there that explains what is happening from what I can see, then at that point, we begin to entertain the idea that this might be an off phenomenon. And the best way to, for me to find out is, uh, the best way to find that out is to take a medicine, you know, the carbidopa, levodopa, if, if let's say that your next dose is within an hour and the last dose was three hours ago and you're having the symptoms now, go ahead and take the medicine a little bit earlier, okay? You know, that's what I tell my patients, take the medicine a little bit earlier when the symptoms are happening, just to see if by taking the medicine, the symptoms clear up. If the symptoms clear up, it is more likely than not, you know, I'm 90% sure now that what my patient is experiencing is an off episode, right? And it's so interesting the way that, that the person that put that question described it because these are very common symptoms where every afternoon between two and 3 p.m., uh, my patients call it here the slum. I just feel like my Parkinson disease symptoms are aggravated. I feel very tired. I don't have any energy whatsoever. And I just have to lay down and let it go away. I take my medicine and then an hour away, I finally begin to feel better. So uh, this is all very common, right? And one of the great opportunities that we have right now is are this. So number one, me as a doctor, my goal will be to adjust your medicine so you don't have the off episodes if in fact that is what is causing this right but then on the other side we also have these newer medicines which are these on-demand therapies right uh you know we have the levodopa inhaler we have uh, we have the apomorphine that is sublingual and we have the apo that is the injectable right so those medicines typically start working faster for a person, those kind of symptoms, I think that trying one of those uh, products your doctor will recommend, depending on your particular situation, might be a good idea. And if the symptoms get better, 
you know, that for the most part explains or, or, or suggests that what is happening is an off episode. All right, we're getting several questions in regards to off because it's just such a phenomena. So let me go through this. Um, one person wanted to know about dyspnea ep episodes. Um, every emergency room they visited, they were misdiagnosed the condition as a panic attack. So wanting to know if that could be part of off. Yeah, so so yes, it could be. So I have many patients that have to breathe. They feel like it is hard to breathe. They feel like they cannot take a deep breath or they feel like they're breathing really fast. And, uh, and once we make sure, so, so once again, the typical uh, way to see it with something like this is I have the patient see the heart doctor, make sure everything is fine. I have the patient see the lungs doctor and do a, a pulmonary function test. And if those doctors tell me, doctor, everything looks normal, then at that time, I begin to entertain the possibility that the problem might be an off episode. So what I will do is I will try to adjust the medicine of my patient or maybe use one of these on-demand therapies to, to make this better. So, you know, there, there are multiple medicines and we can talk about them a little bit later uh, uh, that we can make adjustment to try to see if we can uh, improve this. And I had a couple of people um, write in in regards to foot and toe cramping. Um, they think it's most often when meds are starting to wear off. They feel fuzzy in the head. Um, I need to know if the dose needs to be increased. So, so you know, it, it, everything depends, right? So, number one, so cramping of the toes. Cramping of the toes is a motor off episode, right? Off, off motor symptoms, and. And this is very common and it's most commonly happening between four in the morning and seven in the morning. And people get cramping of the toes, curling of the toes, wakes them up from sleep. It's very difficult. And what many people tell me is I have to take my medicine, but sometimes my medicine might take an hour, hour and a half in the morning to begin working. So, so they have to struggle with these symptoms for a long period. But, but you know what? Talk to your doctor. So you know, I don't want to say that, you know, for some people taking a levodopa might help, but the, the levodopa might take an hour or, or 45 minutes to start working. Uh, those might be excellent opportunities for those on-demand therapies. You know, you, you can use either uh, one of the inhalers in the morning, right after you wake up, you might get an injection with uh, the injectable apomorphine, or, or you might use the apomorphine under the tongue. And we have data, right? So I'm not telling you now opinions. We have data. So following the scientific process that using that kind of products might help in the morning with the off episodes. And I can tell you that the, the symptoms of cramping on the toes usually, uh, usually will get better uh, after taking the Parkinson disease medicines. And then for those patients that not even the medicine is helping and it's getting, it's a problem that is getting worse. Uh, you know, those people can use botulinum toxin. So Botox, the same thing that are, is used for the wrinkles. Uh, your doctor might be able to give you an injection in your foot and that typically will help you for three months minimizing that severe discomfort that you're getting in your feet. So that cramping that is bothersome, Botox can help at the same time. So we have multiple options. It's a matter of, bring the, the right information. You know, if you come to me and you tell me, doctor, every morning at 6 a.m., my foot begins to cramp, it's body bothersome, and, and I have to wake up, and so I know what is happening. This is an early morning dystonia, right? Or if the person tells me, you know what, doctor, every, every during the day, on and off, you know, every three to four hours, my, my, my toes cramp and my foot cramps, and it's very bothersome, I cannot even walk, so at that time, what I will do is, you know, the next question is, is this something that is happening right before the next dose of your medicine, right? And if the answer is yes, then I already know the answer. So we need to make an adjustment to your Parkinson's medicines. Right, you brought up a really good point when you talked about the early morning and the meds, you know, not working. So can we talk a little bit about the morning off and 
you know, that it may take, you mentioned, it may take some time for people to get the meds in their system for them to get absorbed. So I think it would be helpful for people to know like the best way to take their meds, like how much water they need to take, you know, to get the meds through the system and where it actually is absorbed and mm -hmm. why these on-demand therapies can help with that while it's working on getting through the system. Definitely, definitely. So every time you take your Parkinson's medicine, so let's say that I open a, 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 the bottle of my medicine and I have the pill here in my mouth. I'm going to put it in my mouth. I have to swallow that pill. It will go down the esophagus and it will sit in the stomach. In the stomach, there will be some movement that will happen, just like the movement that happens to process your food, right? That will dissolve the pill. And when the pill is dissolved, now the medicine needs to travel from the stomach to the small intestine. It will take a trip in the small intestine until it reaches a part called the jejunum where the medication is eventually absorbed. You know, the, the distal duodenum uh, uh, and jejunum is where the medicine is absorbed. Once the medicine is absorbed in the bloodstream, now it has to travel all over, all over your body travel to the brain and in the brain there is a, a barrier there right and the medicine has to cross that barrier but what is going to happen is from the time that you absorb the medicine in the stomach to the time that it travels to the brain there are two systems trying to process and metabolize that medicine so less of it will get to the brain one of them is an enzyme called dopa decarboxylase, and the other one is called COMT, right? And, and I'm gonna, Hi, Jennifer. I'll go back to, I'll go back to that when, uh, when uh, a little bit later. So that levodopa that eventually made it to the brain cross now has to become dopamine, and now the person is going to get some benefit. So you see that the process can be long and it can be somewhat tedious. And, uh, and there can be many factors that will affect how you are responding to uh, uh, the medicine. So when we speak about these other medications that are the on-demand therapies, one of them is Imbrija, right? Which is the inhaled levodopa. You inhale it, that one goes to the lungs and from the lungs, it travels to your brain, right? So that process is very fast and you are not, subjecting the medicine to any delays that will happen in the stomach because even with Parkinson's, some people will have a slowness of stomach movement. So if the stomach is not moving properly, the medicine is not dissolving and it's not passing to the next level, right? Where the medication is going to be absorbed. So, so these on-demand therapies are going to bypass either the stomach, so one of them is the injectable, right? You inject it, it goes from the skin to the bloodstream and to the brain. The one that you put under the tongue, the apomorphine sublingual, you put it in your under your tongue, the medication is absorbed and it travels into your brain. And then the, the imbrija, which is the inhale levodopa, you inhale it, it goes into the lung. And then from there, it goes into the the brain. So all this medicine has some pros and cons, right? And some people prefer one versus the other. And, and, and you know, some people don't like the embryo. They said, I cannot deal with the powder, right? But other people love it. They, they're like, oh, doctor, it's so helpful. I like it. And it's levodopa, right? It's the same thing I'm taking. And then when we talk about apomorphine, you know, some people tell me, I don't like the, the, the taste of the, uh, of the uh, uh, sublingual strip, but other people tell me, doctor, that thing is, I don't care about the taste because it gets me going, right? And in the morning, you will put it under your tongue and within 10, 15 minutes, it gets you going. And the same thing for the pill. So for those patients that in the morning are feeling like the medication is taking an hour, hour and a half, and we have data that tell us that most people complain that it takes at least one hour for the medication to begin working, this might be really good options because they will start working within 10 to 15 minutes and they start working early because they are bypassing the stomach. So all these challenges that will happen to the peels uh, when they, that they have to be dissolved, they have to travel to the small intestine, all these on-demand therapies are bypassing them. So 
what you need to do is find the one that you think that is the most helpful. I personally believe that just like you have a spare tire in your car, every person with Parkinson's disease needs to have one of these on-demand therapies. And, and the reason is that, you know, if you go to a wedding, you go to a social event and for some reason you turn off, right? And you need a booster on your medicine, then you will have an easy way for you to have them. So talk to your doctor, see what options are available. And, and listen, you know, at least in my clinic, right? I, I have samples, right? And, uh, and I will go ahead and give this to, uh, to, uh, to my patients or they try it before we even get into, uh, into medicines, right? So, or, or having to purchase them or, or anything like that. So always talk to your doctor to see what option, you know, some doctors are not allowed to have samples in their office, but they can have a card that you take it to the pharmacy and they will give you one month of free medicine. So they are allowed to give you those. So those will be options for you. That's fantastic. Now, you, you mentioned it earlier, and I think when we're talking about managing on and off, we should talk a little bit more about dyskinesia, because I think sometimes that is still confusing, and is, it is isn't a balancing act, and I actually had an interesting question about respiratory dyskinesia, if that's a thing, they say that this is caused by too much leave it up or, or an off time. So I've not heard of that. So I'm going to throw that back at you. <laughs> yes, have you yes. talked about dyskinesia whole and maybe address that? Oh, definitely. Definitely. So, so the dyskinesias are those extra movements that typically happen when you are in the on medication state. So it, it, the best description is the person looks fidgety, right? And sometimes the dyskinesias can be mild. So, you know, the person is there, they might move the head, they might move their toes. Sometimes they are just very severe, right? So, you know, when, when sometimes when we see Michael J. Fox on TV, right? And, and, and sometimes you go to YouTube and you look for it, sometimes you see, you see him at a time where he's having really bad dyskinesia. So that is an example. And that's, you know, that's typical life. You know, when you go to the support group, you will see some people having bad dyskinesias. And some people having mild dyskinesia, some other people will have no dyskinesia. So once again, everybody's a little bit different. And one of the types of dyskinesia is there is a respiratory dyskinesia. And what we believe that happens is that uh, um, the, the, the diaphragm and the breathing muscles, you know, are being subjective to, uh, to the excessive movement, right? So the person is having a shallow breathing and they feel like they cannot catch a good breath and they look like, and they're, you know, and, and on top of that, they are moving all the time. So it's like being working out all the time. Okay. So, so the person is losing weight. You know, if this is something happening for a long time, they will, they will be tired. They will be exhausted after an episode of severe dyskinesia. They will have to, to take a break. So this is something that is uh, uh, related to the dyskinesia. Now, Many people blame the dyskinesias on the carbidopa, levodopa, and they say, well, don't take levodopa because you'll get dyskinesias. What happens is that in the long term, okay, if you are being treated for Parkinson's, your brain might experience some changes. And for a short period of time, your brain might become just too sensitive to the medicine. And, and you develop the opposite of Parkinson's. So Parkinson is like pressing the brake on the car. And the dyskinesias is like pressing the gas pedal all the way down, right? So what we need to find is something that will help us modulate this. Because the other option is to not take any medicine for the Parkinson's. But for the most part of the population, this is not an option, right? You want to be treated. You want your symptoms to be better. And this is a long-term complication. You know, about 70% of the people after nine years will develop some sort of dyskinesia, right? Even on low dosages of the medication. And there is something that we learn. Let me tell you this uh, observation, which is very interesting. So, you know, here in the United States, we're very fortunate that if I diagnose somebody with Parkinson's disease, I just write a prescription, you go to the pharmacy, you pick up your carbidopa, levodopa, and you go home and you take it. And you, you know, you take one tablet three times a day, for example, right? And that process took you a couple hours, right? 
But now let's talk about people in Ghana, right? In Ghana, Africa, typically your doctor will allow you to have carbidopa, levodopa after five years with the condition when you're showing now more aggravation of the symptoms. So at one point, there was a study looking into what happened to the people in Ghana compared to the people in, in, the, in Europe, which they follow a system very similar to ours. And at the end of the study, this is what we found. People with Parkinson's in Europe, once they were diagnosed, they were able to begin carbidopa, levodopa. And the people in Ghana, unfortunately, have to wait five years until they were more advanced, until they are able to take the medicine, right? And they do that not because they want to, it's because they don't have sufficient medicine. And what they learn is that people in Ghana, after two years of Parkinson's, so that means seven years after their diagnosis, they already started developing these kinesias, right? And then people that started the medication five years before developed this kinesia just around the same time. So it doesn't seem to be the medication itself what is causing the problem. You know, it's a combination of the medicine, how long have you had Parkinson's, how much levodopa or dopamine neurons you still have that are still working in your brain. So I, that's what I don't delay levodopa. If you need the medicine, you need the, the, the medicine and we should not be uh, avoiding uh, levodopa because, because they're going to make you dyskinetic, right? It's just a part of the process of uh, being ex exposing your brain to the medicines and the time that you have been with Parkinson's disease. So as you can see, these things are very challenging, right? And, you know, there's not a, a final answer for all of this, but the one thing that we learn is if you're very dyskinetic and you lower the levodopa, right? Then the dyskinesias get better, but what happens to the tremor and the freezing of gait and the other symptoms of Parkinson's? They get worse because you lower the, the medicine. So, this is when medications like amantadine, the extended release amantadine. So uh, there is a medication called Gokovri. Gokovri is the only medication approved for these kinesias and it can help modulate whatever process is happening in the brain to decrease the dyskinesia. So that is another medicine that is available that can help not only with the dyskinesia, but they recently had an approval for the treatment of off episodes. So that is another uh, possible therapy and, and the one thing that we have to be aware of is that 20% of the people on this kind of medicines may develop nightmares and some people might develop hallucinations. So by, by this, what I mean is uh, when you try the medicine, always pay attention, be aware because this could happen. And it's just a side effect from the medicine. Once you stop the medicine, the side effects will go away. In my personal experience, some people develop a very mild hallucination. They don't, they're not bothered. The dyskinesias are feeling better. So I tell them, wait another couple of weeks to see what happens. And it is not uncommon that in a good segment of this population, those hallucinations eventually go away and they are able to tolerate the medication in the long term. So that would be another option for the treatment of dyskinesia. So Gokovri, we use it for dyskinesias. The, the other medicines like Imbrija, Kimovi, and Apokin, which are the on-demand therapies, we use them for, for those on-demand treatment of the unexpected off episode. Okay, so that's, it's a lot to, to take in. It's a lot to understand. It's a lot to manage, and it's a lot to communicate. So we, if you registered in advance, you got an email that had a couple of attachments. One of the attachments was a document that Dr. Rodriguez shared with us. It is um, a wearing off questionnaire. It looks like this, if you can see it. I don't know if Dr. Rodriguez, if you could talk a little bit about how you use this in your practice. Um, and then I would love if you could also talk a little bit about other tools that you find beneficial for people to be able to really capture a true picture of what's going on so that you can decide what's the best treatment option for them. What kind of journaling or is videos or, you know, do you have any suggestions on if there's any current wearable technologies, anything that, that we can use that would 
be beneficial. But let's start first with this wearing off questionnaire and, and how this is used. Yeah, so, so you know, the, the short answer is all of the above. And, and let's begin with the questionnaire, okay? So in first place, I need to collect some information that is going to be critical in order for me to decide what kind of medication changes or adjustments my patients will need, right? And this is just like everything. Patients need adjustment on the medicine as the condition is progressing, right? And I need to collect this information and Unfort excuse me, unfortunately, sometimes you as a patient or caregiver sit with the doctor and the doctor doesn't have a lot of time, right? Or, or you know, like I tell my patients, I usually save 30 minutes per patient, right? And uh, from those uh, 30 minutes, I try to collect most of the information. So I have all these formularies, like the wedding off formulary. And if people bring them already filled up, now, you know, five minutes that I was going to spend doing those, now I have them ready. And within 30 seconds, I know what is happening. So we have more time to speak about a lot of the other problems, right? So what that questionnaire will do is it will present some symptoms. So for example, are you having uh, um, uh, anxiety? Are you having tremors? Are you having difficulty uh, speaking? Are you having more balance issues and so on? So there are two columns. Columns number one is, uh, the, the, the column number one is, is this happening, right? So yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. And then the column number two, the question is, does the symptom get better after you take the medicine, right? And that is the definition of an off episode or an off symptom. If the symptom happens and you take the next dose of the medicine and the symptoms get better, now we know that we're dealing with a wearing off phenomenon or an off episode, right? So many times, what I want you to understand is that some of those symptoms are predictable. And in those cases, the problem is very easy because you know that if it is happening within half an hour to an hour from the next medicine, I know that by then the previous dose is going away you're still waiting for the next dose of the medicine. So you might have some of this, but as Parkinson's advances, some people may have what we call unpredictable off, which is an off episode that just came out of the blue that it was not to happen, supposed to happen during that time. And the interesting thing of this unpredictable off is that sometimes they happen over a few seconds. So you are doing very well and you're walking at the grocery store and a minute later, now you are just immobile. You're finding it very difficult to move and your ambulation is getting worse. So, so in, in, that, this, this information is important to recognize. And then the other element is recognize when it is happening. And that is probably what is making the recognition of this off episode so difficult, right? So what else are you? So we have... Uh, we have the, the off questionnaire, the wedding off questionnaire, which is the one that you share with them. And that is probably the most, uh, the simplest one that, that I use, that I have seen. And patients do that while they are waiting uh, to see me in the office. There is another one that is called the Parkinson's disease questionnaire or the Parkinson's disease diary. I'm sorry, the Parkinson's disease diary. And this is actually something that is mostly used in research. And what the Parkinson's disease diary will do is, it will ask you if you are either asleep, off, on, without dyskinesia, on with non-troublesome dyskinesia, or on with troublesome dyskinesia. And every half an hour, you're supposed to make a check mark where you're at. And that way you will be able to tell your doctor where you're at during the day. So. I'm able to know, you know, that way I can know that between 1.30 and 2, you are off, between 5.30 and 6, you are off. But it also gives me an idea if you're having some unpredictable off and some other symptoms. The problem with the Parkinson's disease diary is, number one, it is a research tool. So it is not totally designed to be used at home, although it can be used. But the second one, you know, the second problem is, you know, every half an hour, just going there, it's going to be very difficult, right? You know, you don't have the diary with you every minute and uh, you don't have a pen with you or, you know, many times you, you sit down twice a day to fill it up, but you don't remember very well what is happening. 
And that is something that I learned as a doctor. And that is that when I sit down with my patients and I ask them how much time you're having off, right? They tell me, you know what, doctor, I'm having half an hour here, 15 minutes there, uh, one hour there. So when I put all that together, uh, the person is having two and a half hours in the off medication state per day, right? But now we are relying on their memory. Like, I think that this is what is happening, right? And typically patients tends to underestimate how much time they are spending in the off medication state. And that's the beautiful thing now of those wearables, right? So the wearables work like, a, like one of these Apple watches, right? And, uh, you know, I, I use an Apple watch and I'll tell you something interesting, right? You know how great this technology is. So uh, this past weekend, I, I, I went to the beach with my, with my family. And when I was in the water, the system, you know, the watch gave me a, a, a vibration. And when I look at it, it was asking me, are you swimming now? And if you're swimming, you want me to record it. And then if, if I'm walking fast, right? So one time I was at Disney World, right? And I was trying to get out before the hordes were coming out at the same time. So I was walking really fast and I feel the vibration and the system was telling me, you're walking fast or jogging. Do you want me to record this as a workout, right? So the systems, the, the algorithms are able to recognize what is happening with you. So now there are these wearables where you carry like a watch and they are able to recognize if you are off, if you are on, or they're even able to recognize if you're having some of these kinesias, right? And then the device will collect this information and will present it in a very organized manner to the doctor. And for me as a doctor, that is fantastic because I will have a good idea about what is happening during the day with my patient. And it will give me a guidance about what are the times of the day where the medication is not working well and the times of the day where they might be having some dyskinesia. So now using that information, I will be able to make an adjustment to either how you're taking the medicine or the dose of the medicine or whether you need one of these on-demand therapies. And I am going to tell you something. Every time we do this exercise, we end up with a patient having a, a patient that initially told me that they were waiting up for an hour and a half or two hours. They end up having three and a half to four hours in the off medication state. And they were just not able to recognize that that was in fact what was happening. So the wearables are a, are a great technology. And just like everything, you know, every year, Technology is changing and they are able to identify what is happening with the patient. You know, they keep track of the heart rate. They keep track of the oxygen status. Are they dyskinetic? Are they in the off state? Are they having some tremor? So all that information can be captured by these kind of devices. And I think that the next two to three years are going to bring even much uh, better information. The issue is that obviously this technology is, uh, you know, it, it, it has a price, right? So it's a little bit expensive, but I do believe that at some point, you know, organizations like Medicare should be, you know, should be allowed to cover, uh, you know, using one of these devices at least twice a year or four times a year to have an idea about what is happening with the patient at home, because this is, this is how we get the best information about what is going on at home with my patient? You know, many times I have to tell you, the caregiver works from eight to five. And, uh, you know, the, the patient with Parkinson's is at home. And, you know, many things can be happening, but they are not going to disclose any of that to the caregiver, right? So this might be a reasonable way for us to know what is happening at home. So the, the wearables, which are like watches, are a good option. And the, 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 you know, the paper and pencil uh, questionnaires and formularies and surveys can be also very useful because that's what we have been using now for many years. So this information is very important, again, because that is what is going to provide, that's information that your doctor will need to make the proper medication adjustments. 
And I imagine it's probably very helpful for those who might be living alone and they don't have somebody there to help them, prompt them to document it, or if they have family out of town that is not able to monitor um, and be as involved in going to the doctor's appointments. So, um, and one person asked if the Apple Watch was the only available um, one for use for gate monitoring or any recommendations on Android based devices. So you know what, there's actually, uh, there is a technology that is created specifically for people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, you'll have to forgive me because I'm blanking out in the name of the device right now, but uh, it, is, it is available. And you know, uh, some doctors are already uh, adapting them to their practice. You know, what we're trying to figure out is, you know, these devices have a cost at this point, and we're trying to see if we can at least, um, get some reimbursement from, from Medicare or insurance company. So, so you know, we, we can make the investment and, and try to collect much better information about what is happening at home. So um, I don't have the full details about them, but I can, I can collect some information and pass it on to you. You might be able to pass it on forward. That would be great. And a person was concerned if they had a pacemaker, whether these wearable devices are compatible. Typically, they are fine. Yes, they are not going to change what your pacemaker is doing. And you, you mentioned the care partner's role, and you know a lot of our audience today are care partners. So, can you talk about when you're meeting uh, with your patients, the role the care partners play in giving you some insight, also that they might see something different than the person who's living with the disease, and how we utilize that information. So you know what, the, the care partner is very important and I'm going to tell you why. So number one, um, number one, I'll, I'll give you the, the easiest example. People with Parkinson's disease having mild to moderate dyskinesia, they might not even be aware that they are actually having some dyskinesias. So, you know, the, the, the patient might be having some extra movements, right? And, you know, they might be telling me, you know what, doctor, I'm just not feeling that great. But if I don't get that piece of information that they're having that extra movement, what I'm going to end up doing is probably increasing the dose of the medicine, and then I'm going to make the movements even worse. And what happened is that somebody with moderate to severe dyskinesias might have a higher risk of falls, and uh, they might have more issues with their balance or issues performing their activities of daily living. So if I don't get that piece of information from the caregiver, I probably would be doing a disservice to the patient. And, and this has happened before where I make an, a medication adjustment and then the dyskinesias get a lot worse. And what happened is that I was not aware that the patient was having dyskinesias because the patient never brought that information uh, before. And then the other thing is watch out for the times where the patient does not seem to be responding well to the medicine. So typically the caregiver is, is able to tell me, you know what, uh, he will wake up at eight in the morning, uh, take the medicine. It takes about an hour for the medication to start working, you know, because I, I'm, I'm watching him or her. And that's when the tremors start improving and getting better. And he will be doing fine for the next two and a half hours. And then the tremors are coming back. The freezing of gait is coming back. And then half an hour, 45 minutes after he will take the medicine again and the symptoms get better. So that is an important piece of information that Many times patients might not be aware of what is happening. And I have to say, caregivers are just fantastic at paying attention to these kind of things and bringing this information to my attention. Even more, you know, I, 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 I have some patients that when it is difficult to collect the information, I give them a piece of paper. And in that piece of paper, let me see, I have a, let me see. Uh, it's hard to see with the background, but I have a piece of paper and the piece of paper has you know, it's, it's splitting four. In number one is, tell me how you're taking, how you are taking your Parkinson's medicines at home. And then number two, tell me the questions and the problems that you are having. Number three is for the caregiver. Tell me the problems that you have been observing in your loved one associated with the Parkinson's disease. And then number four is empty because that's what I write, how they are going to take the medications home now. So they see where they were and they see where they will be going home now. So they, they will be able to compare 
what is different. So I like to do that because the care partner is a wonderful source of information. It really is a team effort. Yes. Um, yes. It's good to have that engagement from the very beginning. So when Kira Curran did the survey, they also found that not only, you know, managing and understanding when medications are working, but like actually managing the medications, keeping track of these things and, you know, when they've been added and, and, you know, what's a side effect and what's just part of the disease is very frustrating. Um, it can be very difficult, especially if there's multiple physicians involved for comorbidities and they may have medications for those. So can you talk a little bit about how you find as, as a physician managing medications work well? And we did um, provide in the handouts that you'll get with your follow-up email, one form of a tracking tool. Um, it's not the only thing out there. Things work, you know, for some people that not may not work for others. But in your experience, what do you find has been helpful, not only for you understanding what all is going on um, medication-wise, but for them in terms of managing them? You know what, that is a major challenge, right? And the reason is this. So, you know, we have medication diaries, right? And, and many times patients get all excited or the caregiver will go ahead and put the medicines in the right spot and they have these field carriers and so on. But the truth is that it is very important for me to know what is the medicine that you're taking, how many tablets, how many dosages, and I need to know the time. For people with Parkinson's disease, this is critical. And it's, it's important that you get into this habit. And the reason is this, if, if you or your loved one end up in the hospital, it is very important that you turn those times to the team taking care of you. So they will give you the medicine. So there is one thing is to tell them he takes carbidopa, levodopa every four hours and he's taking two tablets four times a day versus so, so he's taking two tablets every four hours, four times per day. That's one story. But if you tell them he's taking the medication, two tablets, four times a day, your loved one is going to get the medicine every six hours. You see that difference? If he's taking it every four hours, right? Well, he's awake. So eight, 12, four and eight, right? He or she, uh, that's the right timing of the medicine. But if you go to the hospital, he's taking two tablets four times a day, he's going to get them at 6 a.m., 12, 6, and 12 again. So he's going to be spending more time in the off-medication state, and it's going to be very difficult to reverse that. So always have a list of medicines with the particular times that you're taking them, okay, or, or that your loved one is taking them, and the right amount of the medicine. Because the other problem is that, yeah, he's taking carbidopa, levodopa, 25, 100, four times a day, right? Every four hours. But how many? One, two two and a half, one and a half. And what happened is that, you know, the doctor in the hospital, they are not Parkinson disease specialists. They are not movement disorder specialists, right? So they, they don't know, you know, for them, they, you know, for them, people take carbidopa, levodopa, 25, 100, one tablet, three times a day. That's all, that's what you learn in medical school and maybe during residency. So typically the person that is having more advanced Parkinson's taking the medication in the different schedule if you do not provide, you know, when you go to that list that you show them, this is what he's been doing. And we've been doing this for the last six months. The doctor will feel a lot more comfortable of providing you with that. Now at home, people begin well, and then they forget to continue filling up their diary, right? So we don't know. So some caregivers are very good at, at keeping track with the patient and encouraging them to fill up when it's in that they're taking the, the medicines. Other people just give up and then other people are able to afford uh, devices such as the, there's something called the medication hero. And uh, this is actually a medication dispenser. Uh, you have to pay it a, a monthly fee, but every, every time you're supposed to take the medicine, it will nag you until you take it. So it will, it will, make, it will give you an alarm. It will spit out the medicine that you're supposed to be taking. And if you're not taking it, it will continue getting back to you. So there is a, a subscription service, but I have a few patients that use that kind of service and they love it because they now they do not forget. And 
there's proper accountability about how they are taking their medicine. So uh, there, there are multiple things available, but nothing beats the fact that uh, the patient has the motivation and the interest of keeping track of how they are taking the medicine, how frequently and how many. Yeah, and I did have someone um, ask like what they should do if there is no care partner, if they're flying solo. So, you know, really that puts all of the pressure on them to find a way to stick with it and be consistent. That is correct. Yes, it will It will require a lot more effort from you. But, but you know what, you know, once again, you know, I love these Apple watches because you can set multiple alarms or you can set multiple alarms in your smartphone. So at least you will get a reminder about when is it that you need to take the medicine. And another person wrote that just this weekend, they had to get a new prescription and change directions on a bottle as rehab gave the, the medication at a different time. So that whole timing piece, whether it's in the hospital or in a facility, like a long-term care facility is very mm -hmm. important because isn't there a doctor like a window of time that they're still considered on time, but that may not be the right time for the person that needs the medication. That's correct. That's correct. And you know, the, the best thing that you can do for you or your loved one is have a, a detailed list. Listen, you, you never know when tragedy or disaster or a pneumonia will come, right? Or something, you know, somebody will fall down and smack the head and now everybody has to run to the hospital. So you, you need to have a copy of this list right there with you to make sure that uh, when you go to the hospital, you or your loved one will be getting the medication as indicated. Yeah, and, and another person wrote, and this is very true, that um, if your person with Parkinson does have dementia, sometimes these devices um, is too complicated for them. So keeping it simple, having the care partner aware of what's going on. And I know in my uh, history of working with some care partners, you know, early on, they kind of let the, the person themselves manage everything and they weren't aware. And then um, an unexpected crisis occurs. They end up in the hospital and they have to report, you know, what the medications are and they're, they don't know what they are or what the timing is. So it's very, very important that from the very beginning, you know, people are aware of what the medications are when they're taking them. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so, so, so you know what, actually, somebody put it in the comment here, uh, Ken put in the comment here, yep. uh, there's this uh, aware in Parkinson's kit, right, that is, uh, is ideal for, for, uh, for patients, and, and, you know, with this, they, you know, it will explain to the nurses and the team there, you know, I have Parkinson's disease, and, and this is the way that I have to take the, the, the medicine, and these are certain challenges, and no, it's not okay, to take it every six hours, you know, I take it every four hours and it's very critical that I take it at that time and it's going to be kind of productive if, it, if I don't take the medicine at the right time. That is why it is so critical, right? Because, you know, once again, I, I, I'm the one that has been in the hospital, right? And, and you know, when you work in the hospital, you're, you're doing 12 hour shift. And then, you know, let's say that you are the patient arriving at, at 1130 when you're supposed to leave at noon, right? So, you know, whoever that person is, you know, they love you. They want to do the best they can, but they will just try to do everything as soon as they can. And they will need some of this information. So, so, you know, a kid like, like this awarding Parkinson is going to be very important. And, you know, there's a few comments about, you know, definitely have the wear and care kit when you go in. Um, you may have to advocate for your loved one if they're not giving the medications on time. So um, Kelly wrote, I created a med, med time spreadsheet and our doctor signed off on it. So great. Fantastic. That's awesome. Fantastic. Yes. Awesome. Um, so we have time if anyone has any additional questions. And again, if you didn't get the handouts and the original email uh, confirmation, we will be sending those out to you um, in follow up. We also love any suggestions if any of you are using tools that are working well, whether they're you know, technology-based or just paper and pencil. Um, we love to hear what's working for other people that 
you know, we can learn from one another. So, and, you know, Dr. Rodriguez, we, we covered quite a bit in terms of off and dyskinesia. One last thing is, you know, there's so many new medications out there, um, you know, and yes, if you're involved in PMD Alliance, we talk about them a lot, but, you know, for the patients that you have coming into your office, what are some ways that you help them to know um, where to get some good information about the medications, what are side effects, how do, how do you handle that, how you get them to communicate to you, like if they need more information about what's a side effect? Yeah, so, so those are great questions. So in, in first place, you know, a good piece of information for all of you is that most of the medicines that we use in Parkinson's have very similar side effects. So if you hear the side effects of the carbidopa, levodopa, they apply to almost every other medicine that we use in Parkinson's. So just learn them because that will, that, that will help you recognize them a lot easier. Uh, it is it is great that uh, organizations like a PMD Alliance as as well as as well as other they are trying to educate uh, the community with Parkinson's disease about all these new medicines and understand what is the proper use. And I love the fact that PMD you know brings doctors you know movement disorder specialists actually to speak to to all of you for you to understand uh, uh, what is the proper use and the proper positioning of the new medications that are coming out into the market. Then after that, you know, we as doctors, we typically have a lot of literature in our office. So, you know, I have a, a coffee table in my office where I have information about, about you, you name it, Norians and Ungentis and Gokori and just about every other medicine. And then I have a small postcard that has all the medicines that are using Parkinson's disease with the usual dosing and then the most common side effects. So, you know, that, that would be a good guide for you to see what to expect from the medication. You know, like, like for example, there's a medicine called entacapon. So a, a side effect that could happen with entacapon that is different from every other medicine in Parkinson's is diarrhea, right? So at least you will understand that that could be a side effect from the uh, medication. And, uh, and then the other thing is, you know, uh, Every, every clinic will be a little bit different. So, you know, in, in my clinic, we have a, a messaging system for patients that works like a, like a text message system, right? And sometimes patients want to know, doctor, what can be the, the side effects of X or Y medicine, right? So we already, because we expect those questions, we already have a, a very detailed uh, uh, message that explain the side effects of each medicine. So we just, you know, in a matter of a few seconds, we go ahead and send that information back. So patients find it very useful, but talk to the doctor, okay? Don't go to Google or the internet because there's just too much information that is hard to understand. And I have seen many people stopping medicines or adding medicines that they should not be taking, right? So uh, talk to your doctor, send a message, tell them, listen, I, I have this concern about this medicine. Be very clear, list as much information as you can, because that way, if the doctor is busy and they cannot get back to you, but the medication, the, the message was so detailed that the doctor will say, oh, you know what? You know, I understand what she's asking or he's asking, tell them to avoid that medicine or that sounds like a good medicine, right? So uh, that, that would be my recommendation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much of our expertise today. It's been a great session. Again, um, we will make sure you guys get a copy of these handouts. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, we thank you um, for being a part of this program today in this series. I thank everyone for joining us. We will have one more, one more, and the next one we're going to be talking about preparing for the medical appointment. So it'll be the last in our four-part series, um, and we'll cap it off on how we can go in there to your physician's appointment well prepared. Dr. Rodriguez, thank you so much. If everyone that is joining us today would give him the wave of gratitude, we'll send him right. off with our thanks. And I thank everyone for joining us today and hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Everybody have a blessed afternoon. Well, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.